Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our first masterclass of 2021. Happy New Year. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Joanne Bernard, and I am the president and CEO of Easter Seals, Nova Scotia, and I'm also a board member of the Halifax Chambers uh, Board of Director. Uh, today, we're talking about the topic of inclusion, which is extraordinarily near and dear to my heart, both in my present position and in my past uh, position uh, as Minister of Community Services. I introduced the uh, Accessibility Act to the province of Nova Scotia. And so Easter Seals was a wonderful uh, transition for me back into the nonprofit world. And at Easter Seals, Nova Scotia, we work hard every day to make uh, our province barrier free. And we do that through uh, four main pillar programs. The first one being assistive de mobility, which uh, we help persons across the province with assistive devices and healthcare equipment. Uh, we have Camp Technish, which is the only barrier free, fully accessible recreational camp in Nova Scotia. Of course, last summer, we couldn't run it for the first time in 83 years. Uh, but we are up and running in a limited capacity this summer. We have no new leaf uh, social enterprises that helps clients develop new skills, uh, including in increasing their, their independence. And um, we offer a very, very vital and innovative um, employment support program uh, through New Leaf. And finally, our last program, uh, which provides uh, uh, Nova Scotians with Disabilities, the opportunity to participate and learn to sledge, learn to uh, ride, which is horseback riding, learn to bocha, and learn to wheel, which is, which is baseball or basketball, I should say. So the term inclusion covers a wide variety of topics. And today we're focusing on one aspect, workplace diversity and inclusion with a specific focus on candidates and workers with disabilities. So thank you for everyone who submitted questions in, uh, uh, for our presenter, and we'll get back to that at the end of the webinar. Our presenter today and guest speaker is Sean McEwen, Workplace Diversity and Inclusion Consultant Director at Real Eyes Capacity Consultants. Real Eyes supports organizations to build cultural agility and workforce sustainability through diverse and inclusive workplaces that effectively leverage human capital and workplace culture. Sean engages with service providers and businesses across Canada to help build their capacities in these areas. Over the past 22 years, Sean's been designing and overseeing employment inclusion and entrepreneurships the services for people with disabilities while providing leadership and coaching to teams of career practitioners serving job seekers and employers. Through Realized Capacity Consultant, Sean has co-developed employment inclusion training for organizations facilitating employment services for device, diverse groups of job seekers. An avid proponent of collaboration and social innovation, Sean has helped develop social media campaigns, regional, provincial, and national networks dedicated to the employment inclusion of people with disabilities. So welcome, Sean, and thank you for joining us. Thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, not as much uh, a pleasure as it would be to actually be in Halifax. I am a huge fan of Halifax. I would be eating dinner at Edna tonight on uh, Gottingen Street and heading to Field Guide afterwards, all the good things, um, heading down to the waterfront and having a beer at Stubborn Goat if they would uh, open their patio on a cold winter day for me. Absolutely love your town, so I'm very happy to be here. Um, let's, uh, let's get right into this and try and, uh, try and keep it informative, but uh, not too long. Um, so I would like to mention right off the top, I'm doing this, uh, this webinar on behalf of Hire for Talent, which is a project out of CBDC Restigouche. Um, that is the organization that has, has um, contracted with me to develop this material. So some of the objectives today, um, a deeper understanding of workplace diversity and inclusion, understanding sustainable workforce strategies, identifying common ground in employer and service provider objectives, and identifying strategies uh, for effective collaboration. 
So diversity and inclusion are related, but they're not the same. Inclusion is actually a lot more complex than uh, diversity, and we'll talk a little bit about that. As far as sustainable workforce strategies, given some of the coming workforce trends that Canada will be facing over the next 10 to 15 years, we'll be discussing some strategies to develop and maintain a sustainable workforce. Um, and of course, this entire uh, platform for Hire for Talent is developed to encourage employers to improve diversity and inclusion in their workplaces uh, because they, are, they see that as uh, a way to maintain uh, sustainability and healthy workplace cultures. There are publicly funded service providers right across Canada. Anytime you hear me talk about uh, service providers or employment inclusion service providers, these are free services for any employer. They are all publicly funded services uh, funded by the federal government and by various provinces to encourage workforce inclusion for marginalized groups. Um, so all of the resources that come along with that are absolutely free to employers. This is the basic concept I would like to put forward in uh, this workshop today is that the workplace inclusion of people with disabilities can literally future proof your business. There, is, there are reasons for this that we will, we will talk about and hopefully by the end of this presentation, um, you will agree with me that this is, this is not so radical a concept that workplace inclusion of people with disabilities can in fact help future proof your business. So let's start with diversity and inclusion and why they matter. Um, there's these reasons here, the sustainable workforce development, positive workplace culture and performance, attracting talent, enhancing your company brand uh, as, as the diversity of customers increases. This is an important thing. So these are some really important reasons why diversity and inclusion matter. But in order to improve our workplace competencies in these areas, we have to identify and implement some strategies. So let's explore some of these specific reasons on a deeper level. Sustainable workforce development, what is that about? Quite simply, 60% of the people on our planet are living in countries with stagnant or shrinking workforces. Right across our planet, people are dying a little bit faster than they're being born. There are some exceptions to this, but generally speaking, the majority of countries um, and very much Canada and the US, we are slowly but surely losing our workforce. And what's projected to occur is that over the next 10 or 15 years, about 25% of our workforce will age out. We know that this change is coming and that we'll have to adapt. Um, and we also know that responding to these demographic changes and developing sustainable workforce strategies are things that will take some time. So starting sooner rather than later will help. And that adaptation will absolutely involve diversity. And the most successful employers will likely be the ones who started their journey to an inclusive workplace earlier on. So with these folks leaving the workforce, immigration and untapped talent pools are, are the replacement worker groups. Diversity, inclusion, and workplace culture will all factor into job choices and will factor into what, which employers are attracting talent in the future of work. Diversity and inclusion. So we are talking about 25% is retiring uh, over the next, the next uh, 10 or 15 years. The current worker to retiree ratio is four to one. And in 15 years, if we're not replacing it, it would be two to one, which would basically mean we'll crash our CPP system if we don't bring in new workers to be paying into that system. There are, at the exact same time as this is happening, there are an awful lot of Canadians with disabilities who are ready, willing, and able to work, and in fact, currently out of work. So that's something that, that we need to be considering. Um, the reason that this group, the reason that people with disabilities should matter to employers is that this particular diversity group, especially when combined with an employment service provider, can offer employers a way to hack diversity and inclusion. We'll talk more about that. Let's talk more about these coming gaps though. Um, so workplace culture and performance. This, this is, there are direct correlations between your, your culture and your performance. And unfortunately, 
most workplaces are a little bit busy doing the core purpose work to give much time and attention to workplace culture. But as it turns out, that workplace culture impact is huge on how effectively your core purpose work is being achieved. Workplace culture can help an employer speed their business towards growth and innovation and profit, or if it's a negative culture, it can be a real ball and chain that holds business back um, and keeps it from reaching its potential. I think it's worth noting a foundational element of good workplace culture is inclusion. And again, we'll talk more about inclusion and, and dive a little bit deeper into what exactly is that. So employee engagement, which is a byproduct of good workplace culture, um, this, is, this is a pretty significant stat. So uh, the good news is that Canada has one of the most engaged workforces on the planet. Um, the bad news is that it's about 31% of employees that, uh, that identify as engaged at work. Uh, these are well-researched, well measurable statistics on the engagement of employees. And if I could just bring this up, imagine what would happen to your business if this is the current scenario. Imagine what would happen to your business if these numbers were reversed, if you had 70% of people engaged at work rather than 31%. A healthy workplace culture, one that understands inclusion and a strengths-based approach to employment has a significant impact on engagement and productivity. What kind of links? Significant. So when compared with business units in the bottom quartile of engagement, those in the top quartile for engagement realized these, in these levels of improvement. And this is from the State of the Global Workplace report conducted by Gallup. Uh, in 2017, a huge study uh, with employee engagement surveys in over 150 countries with a minimum of 1,000 people uh, surveyed in each country and a whole lot of meta-analysis with 339 research studies across 49 countries. So a huge global study. When you have a healthy workplace culture and engaged people, you have higher customer metrics, higher productivity, higher sales, higher profitability, and at the exact same time, lower absenteeism and lower turnover, uh, less product loss or, or shrinkage, uh, fewer employee safety in incidences, fewer quality incidents. Um, there's, there's direct notable correlation between employee engagement, healthy workplace culture, and business thriving. Another reason diversity and inclusion really matter is attracting new talent. Um, right now, we are, we are moving really quickly towards millennials and Gen Z comprising over 70% of our workforce. So within four years, uh, this younger generation that statistically cares more about diversity and inclusion and healthy workplace cultures, they will comprise 70% of our workforce. Um, Diversity, inclusion, and culture all factor into job choices. When they survey people from this generation and look at what do you want to do, what do you not want to do, where do you and don't you want to work, um, diversity and inclusion and culture factor into those choices. Um, as well, the growing gig economy, which really COVID is just expanding, uh, and a job seekers market will really mean that culture matters. If you're an employer that wants to be attracting high level talent over the next 10 years, um, diversity and inclusion are, are part of the strategy that gets you there and, and thus part of the strategy for a sustainable, uh, sustainable workforce. So there's, there's really a, a coming national and global shift towards a, a job seekers market. And I know that uh, most employers I talk to, they want to be employers of choice in the future of work, they wanna be attracting um, all, all of the best talent. Our, again, that, that core purpose work that our, our businesses and companies are doing, those, those are the ones that are producing company outputs, goods and services. Um, and it's common for any workplace to be devoting a lot of time and effort to the operational or tactical elements of that core purpose work. 
and unfortunately very little time to the strategic designing of processes that support those operations. Um, real diversity and inclusion outcomes and workplace culture outcomes do take time and consideration, effort, and, and even courage sometimes on the part of leadership to, to embark on, on necessary changes. And it's very easy for our, our ideas and our goals to simply remain in the realm of the theoretical if we don't take action towards them. Uh, so this is something that is very important that we can use service providers to help us with as businesses. We can use service providers to collaborate, to outsource a little bit of the work um, and, and to also engage in some direct experiential learning because unfortunately planning for diversity and inclusion doesn't make you good at diversity and inclusion, actually doing it and practicing it and, and learning directly experientially. That, that's what makes you better at this stuff. So to be able to apply strategies, get support from service providers <clears throat> and implement strategies within our work routines is really important. Let's talk a bit about diversity and inclusion and, and define them. These, this is pretty simple and most people are probably very familiar with uh, what diversity means. Um, it's also important to keep in mind what, why does that matter? So that diversity of thought and experience means people are bringing new or different perspectives and approaches to problem solving. And this is a very important consideration. The, the workplace is changing so fast technology um, changes what we do so fast that really we will be facing problems at work that we haven't even conceived of yet. And in order to solve those problems effectively, in order to bring new ideas to the table, that's what diversity means. That, that's why we care about that. That's the strength that's inherent in diversity is that those different life experiences that people face the different challenges that they face and the ways they get around those challenges actually uses different parts of their brain and makes them able to solve problems differently um, than a, a, a homogenous group of people. So this is a simple definition of diversity and the main reason that it matters. Um, it's also worth discussing within this that people with disabilities, I know we, we often think of disability as uh, some, some deficit or liability within the person. But what I've, what I've noted over my entire career working primarily with job seekers with disabilities uh, is that people with disabilities have been solving problems their whole lives that the rest of us haven't had to think about. And that does bring new ideas to the table, that does bring new perspectives. And whatever you think you know about disability, it's, it's probably entirely inadequate. I've been working with people with disabilities my whole life. There's, I don't know, like 300 different types of disabilities that people can have um, and different levels of severity of, of each. And just no two people are the same. And um, I guess I, I would say that disability might affect some element of the person, uh, whether that's what they can see or hear, uh, the way that they learn, the way that they speak, but disability does not negate a person's passions, their strengths, the things that they really care about, uh, the assets that they bring to an employer. Disability doesn't negate everything. It, it, it you know, affects one little part, not, not the entire human. Uh, so that is worth noting. Inclusion, this is the part that I think we all need to learn a lot more about and get, get a lot more informed about, a lot more intelligent about. Um, I mean, some of the simple definitions of it, a sense of belonging, feeling heard, valued, respected. Um, and the indicators include having a voice, having opportunities, having involvement in the same work and non-work activities. Uh, it's, a, it's a factor that improves engagement for everyone, in fact. And it's also an indicator of psychological health and safety at work. I can't emphasize how important a sense of inclusion at work is. And it's a very, very basic, visceral, 
kind of feeling that humans have. We'll explore some of that in a minute. But in a culture of inclusion, all employees would be valued for their unique perspectives, talents, and experience, regardless of any kind of demographic differences. And they'd be provided with the tools and opportunities to contribute to their full potential. Inclusion, we should also understand, it isn't a passive thing that happens based on our value for inclusion. We can't just fist pump and say, yeah, we're, we want to be inclusive here, we value inclusion, and then uh, allow people to engage in behaviors that are not inclusive, that in fact are exclusive. Um, we also need to realize that with our status at work, um, if you are a manager, if you're in a leadership position, you're not going to see and feel the same things that, that other employees are going to see and feel. And um, I'll talk a bit about cultural agility, but in general, the ability to understand that other people might be facing barriers that you yourself don't experience or see um, and, and understanding that just because you don't experience those barriers yourself doesn't mean they're not very real for that other person. And then understanding what are some simple ways to, to accommodate that. I'm noticing a question here, so I'm gonna click on that. Uh, just about slides being sent to participants. I'm sure that, um, that Kayla can accommodate that. Um, so in, in order to really understand inclusion and why it matters so much, it helps to look at its opposite, exclusion. So read through the words on this slide. Um, and as you read and hear these words, think, think about how they feel to you, if there's any kind of emotional response, uh, alienate unseen, exclusion, outcast, unwelcome, inconsequential, don't matter, frozen out, uninvited, unheard, voiceless, silenced. How, how do we think an absence of inclusion affects people? Do we perform well under these circumstances? Do we give our best? Do we stay at a place where these are the ways that we feel? Inclusion really needs to be deeply embedded in workplace culture, because if it's not, our organizations are paying for its absence. When people have feelings of exclusion at work, when there's an absence of inclusion, um, that the level of absenteeism, um, the level of stress leaves, something as simple as people not performing, having to go on stress leave, uh, coming back, maybe still not performing because the thing that's affected them, the workplace culture hasn't changed. This stuff matters so much. Um, I Two years ago, I was at a workplace that, uh, that was suffering in some ways in terms of inclusive culture. And out of a team of 12, nine of those people are no longer there. This was less than two years ago. And if you look at what is the cost of losing veteran employees in an organization. Think about that, you know, 80% um, of the staff left over a two year period or less than two year period. What kind of cost does that cause for an employer? Um, that's a pretty significant impact. What's really important for us to understand is that inclusion isn't just some nice thought that we have that, uh, that you know, has come about um, in the last 20 years. In fact, inclusion has been integral to our sense of well-being as a species for hundreds of thousands of years. Inclusion is hardwired into us. Our brains actually read uh, social needs similarly to primary threats and rewards. Neuroscience shows that exclusion activates basic survival responses. And this might seem a little bit wild, but if you think about the fact that really we've been living in this state, you know, walking around in clothes and using tools and having a global economy and stuff, you know, this is really recent stuff. Our brains have evolved over four to seven million years to perceive social connections as essential to our survival. We survived as a species because we lived in groups. We're absolutely hardwired to perceive relatedness 
as safe and rewarding and to view exclusion as unsafe and threatening. And those times when we have strong visceral reactions to subtle threats to our inclusion or status in a group. For over a million years, that was literally a threat to our survival. And our brains haven't figured out that it's no longer a threat to our survival. You know, somebody, um, somebody being mean to you in a meeting in front of your colleagues isn't a threat to your survival, but your brain still registers it on that level. And so that's one of the reasons why inclusion matters so much and why we really need to, as employers, as leaders, be thinking more about how, how do we form cultures that are inclusive, um, what, are the, what are the tools that we can use to help us with that? And again, I, I would state that hiring people with disabilities, especially uh, in combination with services provided by a funded service provider, can really help improve your capacity in that area. What's really impactful about inclusion, um, you might think, you know, well, yeah, there's one person at work that I guess gets bullied a little bit or whatever. What's really impactful is that even witnessing behavior that excludes a coworker makes us lose trust and engagement in our workplace. So you don't even have to be a victim of exclusion. Um, you, you can just witness it. And the worse the exclusion behavior, the worse the impact is on the rest of us. If you want to see an amazing resource, uh, in this area, I'm just gonna, I don't have any kind of relationship with this publisher or this author, but um, Your Brain at Work by David Rock, brilliant book that uh, contains detailed information about all of this. And in fact, they have a, a great website, um, Neuro Leadership Institute. Uh, yeah, and I think their website is just neuroleadership.com. Uh, that's a great resource for employers interested in reading up on inclusion and figuring out ways to do it better. So inclusion is a universal need. It matters to us all. And when we're included and valued, we're happy. Um, hiring people with a disability for the first time, the way that this helps employers get better at inclusive workplace, it takes us out of our comfort zone a little bit. You know, it's very easy um, to just kind of fall into a track and not pay attention to the details at work. You know, we're really busy with a hundred different things all the time. Um, hiring a, somebody with a disability for the first time will take you out of your comfort zone a little bit and divert your attention to the actions and protocols that include people and support their success. And ideally that attention and action become habit. So this is why hiring, mentoring, and accommodating an employee with a disability can build a workplace's capacity to better hire, mentor, accommodate, and include all new employees. And in fact, there's clear evidence that we'll look at in a minute that shows that hiring a worker with a disability actually improves your company's capacity for diversity and inclusion right across all diversity categories. I'm just checking the Q&A box. Does the lack of inclusion, one, create or feed conflict inside an organization, and two, reduce the attractiveness and sense of quality to other organizations, including clients or stakeholders? Um, so a lack of inclusion will absolutely cause cause conflict and, and feed conflict inside an organization or cause that person to leave. And again, if simply witnessing uh, behaviors of exclusion causes you to have less investment and engagement in that employer, um, then the allowing it to happen will, will absolutely erode your workplace culture um, and engagement for the rest of the people there. And as far as reducing the attractiveness and sense of quality, Absolutely, people, unhappy people that leave organizations because they didn't feel like they were included, included especially if they're a diversity group, um, they're probably gonna talk about that. You know, um, if you wanna know uh, how, your, how your past employees feel about you, um, check out your Google reviews, <laughs> you know, there's a lot there. How can someone in a non-management role encourage more workplace diversity and inclusion in workplaces who don't see a need for that expansion? Um, I think providing information is important to simply say that um, 
there's clear evidence to show that diversity and inclusion helps a business be more resilient. We know that the, the demographics are changing over time. Share this presentation with them. Um, I don't know that you can make a workplace change, but you can certainly provide people with enough information that they, they might be able to make those changes. Um, next question from Judith. Stats Canada tells us that disabled people who work in organizations typically earn 60 to 70% of able-bodied employees. This is yet another way that companies can lower wages. I find that reprehensible and frankly, no one knows and few keep track. Uh, absolutely true, most marginalized groups, I mean, in Canada still, even women statistically earn less than men. So uh, that disparity does not surprise me. I don't know why it's taking so long to, to correct. Um, and I think it's, it's essentially a, an employer, employee rights issue, a human rights issue. Um, and maybe to the jobs that, uh, that marginalized people end up getting. Um, because, because people will often, if you look at, at recruitment, it is basically a system of exclusion. You know, when you get 100 resumes and you're trying to whittle that down to four job interviews, you're going to write people uh, out of that interview process based on anything you can, typos in their resume, lack of experience. Um, what research shows us is that people also will reject resumes based on uh, last names that suggest English might be their second language. Uh, maybe they have an Indigenous last name. We know that um, whether people like it or not, they exercise some degree of bias when they are uh, when they're recruiting. And this is, again, another one of the reasons why I think it's a, a very effective strategy to develop partnerships and talent pipelines with diversity organizations, such as uh, disability employment inclusion service providers. And again, that is a group that helps you get better at all diversity and helps you shift the culture a little bit. So let's keep moving on. I wanna talk about something called inclusive design, uh, also known as universal design. Um, this doesn't need to be a scary concept. It's really a mindset. It's not something you need academic credentials for, um, but the concept is really intriguing because it simply involves designing things and environments and systems in ways that work for everyone. And that is, that is a simple thing that any employer can do. Um, if you're purchasing new software, if you're purchasing new desks, furniture, whatever, simply asking, you know, who, who might this not work for? Um, the final comment, the final bullet on here, who would be excluded by this environment, process, or system? You know, when you're looking at new building space and you see that the building's not accessible, with 20% of Canadians identifying as people with disabilities, and keeping in mind they all have loved ones, friends, relatives, et cetera, do you want your business to have their business um, when, when they go shopping? You know, that, that's something that, that I think just allows us to serve everyone. And honestly, having a building that's accessible, um, sure, it might help uh, a gentleman using a wheelchair to get in the building, but it's probably also going to help some mom pushing a stroller to get in the building or a dad pushing a stroller to get into the building. Um, so designing things and environments in ways that just work for everyone right off the start, that is an intelligent strategy. And that's, that's what inclusive design is all about. So things that are usable by all people to the greatest extent possible. This is a process, not a result. We'll talk a bit more about it. Um, the employment service providers that exist right across Canada, they have to do this kind of thinking um, all the time when we're helping employers and helping new employees with onboarding, training, and retention processes. But it's also the kind of creative thinking that workplaces start to develop and engage in when they employ a person with a disability. It's very common for colleagues or employers in a workplace to see, hey, this one thing isn't working very well for the new employee. 
because of some barrier they might have. Um, here's a way around it. Here's a way we can we can solve this. And very often, what people discover is that the accommodation that they put in place ends up being the way that everyone does it from then on, because it's just easier and it makes more sense for people. Um, so disability inclusion really trains inclusive environments and culture. And again, we get good at the things we put into practice, not just the things that we think about. The, I, I would revisit who might be excluded by this, whether it's a purchase, a software, uh, a communication system that you want to use, who might be excluded by this and why um, is a good question to ask when you're trying to build a more inclusive workplace. I hope that makes sense. Here's an example of inclusive design. Uh, this actual, this slide is meant to be discussing equality versus equity. I don't care about any of that right now in this moment. Um, what I would point to is the third slide where there's a fence that all three of these people can see through. That's an example of doing things right off the start that work for everyone, as opposed to spending a lot of time trying to accommodate every, every person in a different way. So other examples might include automated door openers, wheelchair ramps in a busy shopping mall, uh, Siri, uh, the platform that we're using right now. We can record this Zoom meeting for people to listen to later or watch later. Um, we can use an automatic transcription feature to create meeting notes. Um, these, these are all actually accessibility features that allow greater participation by everyone. Um, so maybe think about that. Are there examples of products, devices, or systems designed for accessibility that you use frequently? I know that uh, a few years ago when we um, we hired a, we were a disability organization and we hired a gentleman who used an electric wheelchair and found out remarkably quickly just how inaccessible our work environment was. Uh, because again, you don't necessarily see the barriers that you yourself don't face. So as soon as we hired this gentleman, we did spot all of the barriers. We did see there were problems. Um, installing automated door openers, I can't believe the number of times people carrying two cups of coffee or a box of files or whatever would just hip check the door opener. Um, you know, we hired, we installed this device for people with disabilities. And as it turned out, it was just a, a convenience device for everyone else in the workplace. So this is why inclusive design works because it works for everyone. So here's some examples of inclusive design at work. So employment accessibility. There are things employers can do with their application process. They can provide uh, interview accommodations. Accommodations aren't something that always need to start when a person starts work. Sometimes the accommodation might happen uh, as early as the interview. Um, employee orientation, honestly, sometimes the, the thing that's most inclusive is just a best practice, you know, assigning direct mentorship, recognizing uh, the value of social learning, the fact that there are two ways that people learn at work, and one is through work routines, and the other is through social learning. And if we don't figure out ways to leverage that social learning, if we don't figure out ways to really involve people uh, with each other in the work environment, it's going to take longer for them to learn. Um, having a good workplace culture, uh, psychological healthy health and safety at work, those are things that serve everyone. Yes, they will make it better for a person with a disability to be able to fit into that environment or any diversity group to fit into that environment. But more importantly, it's, it's just good business. It's a good business practice for all of your employees. Um, cultural agility, realizing that people face different barriers than you do. Emotional intelligence, uh, awareness of yourself, of your biases, of any kind of micro inequities, and also just clear leadership and expectations. That's one of the things that over the years I've seen 
is most helpful for employers because they're hiring a person with, um, in our case, very often a learning disability, the employer realizes, oh, I need to put things in clearer language in order for this, this person to really understand what I'm saying. And then they realize everyone understands me better when I talk this way. Because what works for a person with a learning disability also works really well for a person with English as a second language. Um, so, so very, very often, um, the best practices, the things that we see as, um, um, as common good practice, those are actually elements of inclusive design, which means that it's not a massive stretch for us to be able to do it. So a framework for diversity and inclusion success, if we had to break this down into what's a simple recipe for getting better at diversity and inclusion success, um, these are subtitles for the next three slides. So growth mindset, intentional workplace culture, and collaborative and experiential learning. Those would be the framework that, that I would recommend. And a growth mindset is simply the belief that you, your colleagues, your employees are capable of acquiring and applying new knowledge, right? Um, what do we believe about our capacity to learn, our capacity to collaborate and apply new knowledge? If we're positive about that, we believe that, yes, we absolutely can learn new things and apply them, then we will be likely to achieve that. It's kind of a that self-fulfilling prophecy thing. Um, and a growth mindset is really critical to culture change in a workplace. You're not going to achieve culture change uh, with, with a fixed mindset. And you know, the mindset, it happens along a spectrum. Nobody's 100% growth or 100% fixed mindset. It's along a spectrum. But if you believe in the value of diversity and inclusion, and you understand that there are some things that you don't currently know but need to learn, and you believe that you can learn that, then that's a growth mindset. And it would be something that would allow your business to adapt, to be flexible, and to hopefully be more resilient over the long term. Intentional workplace culture. This is really about um, leaders, managers, the people that are helping to shape the workplace culture for them to actually be intentional about that and, and not just be you know, passive in that. Assessing a workplace culture for strengths and weaknesses, I think has great value. There are enormous resources in Canada to do this kind of thing, including the guarding minds at work psychological health and safety in the workplace analysis. Um, that's a free platform that anyone could use. Leadership really has to be the culture champion. You have to, have to care about that. Keeping in mind that what gets measured gets done, what, what's rewarded gets repeated, whether it's good or bad. And establishing team norms based on the values and the culture that you want. Um, yeah, learning at work is, it's, all about these things, the work routines and social learning. So these, these things can be used to help shift a culture. And again, hiring a person with a disability typically causes a workplace to pay unprecedented attention to the onboarding, the training and the communication processes. So the strengths and the flaws of all these processes get revealed and that resulting clarity can be used to create changes that benefit all employees, including diversity groups. Collaborative and experiential learning. Um, this is an important consideration and the, the opportunity here of working with service providers, there is a collaboration and hiring people with disabilities, there is the experiential learning. And this activates more of our brains for problem solving. Um, collaboration increases our resources, our ideas and our perspectives. Um, you know, neuroscience tells us that effective collaboration releases oxytocin and dopamine, which are the same happy chemicals that dancing or hugging a loved one release. Um, this increases our commitment, our engagement. It actually makes this, this whole experience feel pretty gratifying uh, and interesting. Action or experience builds our capacity and teaches us much, much more than merely thinking about, about action. So the intentional formal collaboration of service providers and employers holds enormous potential uh, for diversity, 
and inclusion results and have generally been overlooked thus far. Um, it, it is common for service providers to be reaching out to employers. It's not that common for employers to be reaching out to service providers. Um, but the, when, when a good partnership is formed, um, it, it's very, very common for the results to actually exceed the employer's expectations. And in fact, that's a very common uh, occurrence for us to hear from employers. Um, the, there's a program that I help run in Calgary um, called Gateway Association, which is a youth employment service program. And very, very common for employers to be calling us three weeks later saying, I don't know why I didn't do this sooner. This is the this is the smartest thing I've ever done. Do you have six more guys like this? You know, they're they're very happy with the results, with the the quality of the the worker, and as well with the effect on their workplace. So this is the opportunity that's before us right now, and the one that Hire for Talent is really trying to encourage. I probably should drop the Hire for Talent uh, website address a couple of times, and it's simple. It's just HireForTalent.ca but they offer a whole variety of resources that can help employers improve diversity and inclusion, specifically around disability. They also have a service provider directory that uh, is developing and growing. Um, I think the service provider directory was just started this fall, but there are more and more service providers on that all the time. So if you're interested in collaborating with a service provider, there's an easy way to find one at that Hire for Talent website hireforTalent.ca. In terms of disability impact on workplace culture, just to, to cover the full, the full range of the impacts, um, it's attractive to other talent pools. It indicates that you are an inclusive employer. Um, you are typically getting motivated, engaged employees and improved morale, lower staff turnover, enhanced brand, increased productivity, profit, innovation, and safety. I thought the innovation factor was really interesting when I was um, reading through a lot of the research. Absolutely, diversity in particular, people with disabilities, will improve innovation and safety. Um, and of course, improved cultural competencies. Insights gained by hiring people from a disability-based diversity group can easily be applied across all diversity groups. So this is inclusive design in action to some degree. Um, disability, I think it's worth stating that disability frequently impacts positively on staff morale. Um, and I, I'm not really sure why that is, but employers very consistently are reporting back, so happy that we hired this person, you know, this, this has been a, a great thing for us to do and everyone is happier at work. That I think, that alone is worth consideration. Um, let's look at some of the, so this is, this is from the Institute for Corporate Productivity. It's an American organization um, that did a study and I think they've repeated it a couple of times. So there's uh, in 2014, 2016, and 2019, they've studied all these employers across the United States that hired people with disabilities. Now, this is specific to hiring people with intellectual disabilities. So like autism, Down syndrome, FAS, things like that. Um, but these were the things that the employers reported on, that their inclusive culture is attractive to other talent pools the addition of highly motivated employees, enhanced employer brand, um, improved productivity, improved customer satisfaction, et cetera. The stat that I would like to draw your attention to though uh, is down in the lower left corner, um, noticeable increase in cultural competencies across the organization as a result of disability inclusion education. So the insights that employers gained by hiring people with disabilities could be applied across all differences, such as race, gender, ethnicity, age, et cetera. Um, and this is, yeah, it was just 2019. So this is just a couple of years ago that this report came out. And yeah, 43% of employers immediately noted that. And I would suggest based on my direct experience that that, that stat is understated. I'd like to talk a bit about service providers because I don't know that all employers understand 
uh, what an employment service provider is. So typically the service provider is paid by the provincial or federal government to provide employment services to a person with a disability. What virtually all service providers know is that if they're not also valuable to the employer, then they're not going to effectively engage you and they're not going to get the results that they're trying to get for the job seekers that they are seeking. Those service providers are engaged in getting people with disabilities involved in the type of work that that person wants to be involved in. So it's very, very uh, based in talent matching. It's very person directed. You know, this isn't a scenario where we're just trying to get as many people out the door and into any old job as we can. That is, that is absolutely not the ethic at work. Um, what we're trying to do is actually exactly what you were trying to do as an employer. We're trying to facilitate really high level talent matching um, with social inclusion and performance and job retention. Um, really what we want is to get fired. We, we, want, we want the employer to say to us, we got this. Um, you know, thank you for your help. Uh, this is a brilliant employee. We're really happy with this. And you've taught us what we need to know and we don't need you anymore. That, that's what we're shooting for is to essentially serve employers so well that you don't need to talk to us anymore. Um, because there's an awful lot of people that we need to serve. So we'd like to, like to kind of keep moving along to the next job seeker where possible. As far as what service providers know and, and understand, workplace cultures that get or don't get inclusion, supervi supervisory styles that work or don't, workplace accommodations, mentorship, factors in engagement, retention, uh, effective onboarding and training methods, failure factors. These are things that every service provider team has a window into 365 days a year. We're doing this work all the time. We see so much workplace culture. We really do have some great insights about it. And I think effective and intentional partnership with businesses would really be a, an effective way to improve diversity and inclusion for you. In terms of job seeker services, <clears throat> what we're doing to help the job seekers is identify their unique strengths, interests, and qualities, helping them to match those things to job choices and explore those job ideas, connecting them to occupational training, testing, skills development, um, and then identifying environments and accommodations that really help those, help those people shine in a workplace. Um, of course, educating them about work culture, employer expectations, and we very, very typically are, are facilitating interviews, like directly bringing people to interviews. Um, to help make that uh, a comfortable experience for all parties. So those are some of the things that we're doing with job seekers. You can see that through these services, prospective employers contacted on behalf of each job seeker are being connected with basically pre-screened, invested diversity candidates. In terms of services for employers, uh, obviously the talent source and talent matching, interviewing and onboarding support, designing accommodations, performance improvement plans, uh, training orientation processes. If you need help with that, if there's some reason that uh, the person requires a little bit of extra attention, we would typically help with that. Um, diversity and inclusion resources and coaching, we can absolutely be involved uh, to help you improve your diversity knowledge, your inclusion knowledge um, and improved workplace culture through that diversity and inclusion. Statistics say that employers experience hiring failure in approximately 46% of their recruitment endeavors. So that would be people not working out, poor fit, poor performance, the employee leaves or is terminated. Uh, the service providers that I've known across Canada the last 22 years, their stats are nowhere near that bad. Um, they wouldn't get funded if they were. Um, so we can also build your capacity for a more diverse and inclusive workplace. What else could we be doing to serve employers? That, that's a question whose time has come. And that's, that's why this workshop is, is being done to kind of connect this, this publicly funded uh, source of diversity candidates and support resources with the business community and looking at what can we accomplish together. 
Again, we have the exact same goals, uh, great talent matches, work performance, engagement, social inclusion, a valued role, independence and job retention. Service providers and employers want the exact same thing. Um, so having a conversation about how we can work together more collaboratively to achieve those goals is, is an important consideration and one, one whose time is here. So here are some questions that uh, you as, as businesses could think about. Um, if there are service providers on this call, um, that, that would be worthwhile them thinking about as well. What do we want and need from each other? What are we and aren't we able to help with? Uh, what questions do we have for each other? How can we advise and support each other for greater outcomes? The opportunity to address these questions together and to identify next steps in collaboration and development of workplace inclusion partnerships a partnership between an employer and service provider. Uh, that is the ultimate focus of, of this. And again, the Hire for Talent website provides extensive tools and information. Um, so as you work through these, these questions now or later, um, consider the possibility of meeting with local service providers. Um, connect, connect with folks in Halifax. And if you need to find uh, who those folks are, probably the Hire for Talent website can help you with that. If that does not work, you can contact me directly and I will happily connect you with many of the amazing service providers I know in Halifax. And I think that that is our last slide. So I'm going to stop sharing and maybe we can go to some of the questions that I see piling up here. One question here, Sean, uh, is there a way to identify and address accommodation needs in the interview process? Previous practice office puts a candidate on the spot to identify the accommodation, and they might be uncomfortable in doing that. So how do we take the onus off the candidate um, to provide personal and sometimes sensitive health information? Yeah, I, I have a very clear strategy for this. So I think one of the most effective things that you can do as an employer is to say that, is, is to have an inclusive employment policy to say that you are an inclusive employer, you do want to recruit uh, diversity groups, including people with disabilities. If you require any type of accommodation to apply for the job, to interview for the job, uh, your policy is that the person may ask for said accommodation and may not be refused um, the interview or the job for any type of reasonable accommodation request. I think putting it in policy makes it a little more transparent and makes it a little bit more obvious that, okay, they put this in writing, this applies to everyone, they're serious about this. They're not just trying to trick me into disclosing something that they'll then use to exclude me. Um, so perhaps so, you could put that in the job posting, that you do have that piece of policy within your organization. And hopefully yeah. that sends a clear message to prospective employees with disabilities that they are going to accommodate me and the onus is going to be on them, not so much on me. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's totally relevant and an important step for an employers to develop an inclusive, uh, inclusive employment policy to put it in the job posting, put it on the website. If you're using uh, applicant tracking systems, so electronic applications, if folks are having difficulty using that, which is very common for some folks with disabilities, um, lots of the applicant tracking systems are not, um, not accessible. Mm -hmm. And so if you actually include there, if you have an employment barrier that prevents you from using the system, please contact us directly at blah, blah, blah. Um, and I'm not suggesting that you have to hire some percentage of people with disabilities, but given that 20% of Canadians identify as having some type of disability, it seems to me that at least one person in every five candidate interview session should be a person with a disability, that, that that's the demographics in our society. Um, we should be trying to meet that in the workplace. Absolutely. And in Nova Scotia, per capita, it's actually higher. We're one in four. We're about 26% uh, with people who self-identify as having a disability. Well, on that note, Sean, I'm going to, to wrap up and we're sadly out of time. This has been extraordinary. 
Thank you for everyone for attending today's webinar. And I hope that uh, the session today answered some of your questions about uh, working with persons with disabilities and the, and the opportunities that we all have to have an inclusive and diverse workforce. And as Sean mentioned, there's many resources that are available um, to your team for finding the right candidate to accommodate their needs. Please reach out to Sean if you have any further questions. He's already said that. He's been quite gracious. Uh, please join us tomorrow and Friday for our conversations with two of our candidates um, who are vying to be premier, my good friends, Randy Delory and Ian Rankin. And on Thursday, we're hosting a webinar on how to build relationships through the power of writing. And you can register at halifaxchamber.com events. This webinar was recorded and will be available to all attendees shortly on YouTube. So have a great day, everyone, and uh, stay safe. And thank you, Sean. Really appreciate it. Bye. Bye, Halifax. I miss you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.